So thanks. Uh, we're going to start this afternoon with the session on assuring site readiness and intervention fidelity. And our, uh, our uh, session leader is Dr. Lauren Eister, who is a senior fellow in the Income and Benefits Policy Center at the Urban Institute where her research focuses on innovative workforce development programs and how to best evaluate and learn from them. Dr. Eister has examined industry-focused job training and career pathway initiatives implemented through the workforce system and at community colleges. She studies how these programs can best provide education and training to different groups such as laid off workers, youth, low income people, and older workers. She also researches how systems and various stakeholders can collaborate to help these people find and retain jobs. Dr. Eister has a PhD in public policy and administration from the George Washington University. And in this session, Lauren will actually do the introduction of the commentators. Lauren? Thank you so much, Patty, and thank you all for being here, coming back from your, your quick break. Um, and the, the day has been really interesting and I think um, really leads us well into the topic for today on um, preparing sites, uh, ensuring site readiness, as well as implementation fidelity. Um, and you know, today we're really going to um, explore this issue a little bit more, the strategies that really can support that to ensure a rigorous evaluation. Um, practices, tools um, that can really support those efforts and how to overcome challenges because we see these challenges happening on the ground and how you identify them, how you um, can, can address these issues. Um, and we have uh, three great commenters today, but, um, and I'm going to introduce them in a second, um, but uh, just uh, a couple of um, uh, things uh, as you're, we really want the audience to be engaged um, and we would love questions. We're going to have each speaker present for about seven minutes. Um, there, we don't have slides, so it's a little different. We're just more of a panel kind of format here. And what we're really um, gonna get from them is their experiences on uh, ensuring site readiness and implementation fidelity. So, um, and as you are have questions, um, ideas, comments, if you would put them in the Q&A um, box. I know you all have been doing that and thank you, Samantha, for putting that up. Um, that would be a really, really helpful. Um, and again, before I introduce them, what I'd like to do is do a poll question. Samantha, if you would put the first one up. We just want to get a little bit of a sense of um, the uh, experience of, of the audience and um, just learn a little bit about from you from this first question. I'll give you a few minutes to, or a few seconds here to, to fill it out. Great, oh wow, so just a total range here and um, that's, that's fantastic, um, really, really helpful in understanding some of your experience, level of experience around monitoring random assignment. Um, and we're gonna do a few poll questions as we go along, just to, again, to continue to learn a little bit more about you and then we can sort of tailor our questions and comments. Um, um, around that as we get to the discussion portion. And again, I'll, I'll prompt you all at the end of the, um, uh, the commenters' um, remarks uh, to, again, ask questions. So, um, great. So let me introduce um, our, our, our commenters here. First, we have Karen Gardner, um, a principal associate at Apt Associates. Uh, she has more than 25 years of experience directing large-scale random assignment studies. Uh, in the areas of workforce training and income security. Uh, she conducts implementation research and also provides evaluation technical assistance to programs. Um, she directs, directed the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services funded uh, uh, Pathways for Advancing Careers and Education, PACE, evaluation of nine career pathway programs. Uh, she currently directs the U.S. Department of Labor's American Apprenticeship Initiative evaluation and the evaluation of the round for trade adjustment assistance community college and career training grants. <laughs> As always, it's a mouthful. Um, Karen and I worked together on that one, so uh, the, the, after many years, I still, I still stumble over it a bit. Um, Ms. Gardner is a project quality advisor on projects in App Social and Economic Policy Division and oversees all division work related to HHS administration for children and family contracts. 
She was formerly vice president at the Lewin Group, and Ms. Gardner holds a master's degree in public policy from the University of Chicago. Next, I'm going to introduce Jenny Riley. Uh, she is an associate director at Westat with more than 20 years of experience in design, implementation, and management of research studies and program evaluations in the areas of mental health, disability, and employment. She has served as project director or task leader on a number of federal studies focused on the improvement of employment outcomes for individuals with disabilities. And much of her work has included evaluation of programs aimed at uh, vulnerable populations, including people with mental health disabilities, social security disability beneficiaries, youth with disabilities, and veterans with disabilities. She's currently serving as project director for the supported employment demonstration and was a task lead uh, for instrument development and data management for the mental health treatment study to randomize clinical uh, trials funded by Social Security Administration. Um, and Ms. Riley has you know, worked on a number of projects for the Department of Labor on evaluations of grantee programs intended to improve the education and employment of individuals with disabilities. Um, and last but not least, um, we have um, Mike Fishman. Uh, he is the co-founder of MEF Associates and serves as president and consultant for the firm. Mr. Fishman's consulting work is related to welfare reform, employment and training, SNAP, child support, Head Start, and the range of uh, human service programs uh, with which he has worked throughout his career. He has directed policy research, evaluation, and technical assistance projects for the Office of Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, the Administration for Children and Families, the Office of Head Start, and the Employment and Training Administration at the U.S. Department of Labor. Also, uh, the Economic Re Research Service at the Department of uh, Agriculture, State Governments, and Foundations. So, um, he, before he was at MEF, um, he served as Director of Federal Human Service, uh, Director of the Federal Human Services Practice at the Lewin Group for 11 years. He's got over 25 years of experience managing uh, health and human service programs. Uh, uh, at NDHHS and uh, the Department of Agriculture's uh, Office of Food and Nutrition, Nutrition Service. Um, and uh, Mike uh, earned his master's degree in organizational psychology from Antioch College Northwest and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Southern California. So with that, um, and just a great group of people that are able to provide their insights, they have so much experience uh, 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 designing and implementing these very large scale studies and evaluations and employment and training. So we're really excited to hear from them on site readiness and implementation fidelity. Karen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Lauren. So uh, it's a pleasure to serve on a panel with Lauren and Mike. We've worked together for years and years and um, it's uh, nice to meet Jarnay as well. Um, I'm gonna uh, share a few anecdotes about um, site readiness, site recruitment activities, assessing fidelity based on um, years of doing site um, visit, site visits and site recruitments um, for multi-site um, um, random assignment studies. Um, so, uh, a lot of what I'm saying dovetails with what has been said earlier, um, in particular, John Martinez. Um, he has done a lot of, like, I, I also have been able to work very closely with him in the past on um, recruitment. So um, this will just kind of follow along with what he has um, said earlier. But the first... Uh, the first point I want to make is a stakeholders, stakeholders, stakeholders. I, I know John hit on this, but it's important to have internal stakeholders and external stakeholders at the table when you're considering um, when you're considering a site for a study. Um, just to use a couple of examples, one um, was actually for Pace, talking with a community college where the dean was very interested in being part of the study. The funding partner, which was the workforce. Um, investment board for the particular county was very opposed to it and through multiple meetings and sitting down with him with the um, the WIB and with other leadership at the college he was able to explain why doing an RCT would be very helpful to the college help them even if there was no findings it would help them understand what they were doing maybe wasn't on track and so there were a lot of benefits to being in the study they came around and it was a really good situation. Um, on the other hand, um, 
I was part of a study of um, ESL programs where um, the individual who was in charge of one of the schools that provided um, these services in uh, Florida left partway through the um, random assignment period and with her went all the support for the study. And so the new, her replacement wasn't a supporter. And as a result, the staff didn't get behind the, behind the um, study, it basically fell apart. Um, they stopped implementing key parts of it. They didn't, you know, random assignment didn't hold. People went to whatever class they wanted to. And so it just, it's very important that everybody be at the table. Um, and so, not just funders and leadership, but also line staff. Line staff have to understand because they're the ones who are going to have to usually break the news to the individual that you can't be in this, you know, you can do business as usual or something else, but not this particular study or project. Um, and that's a really hard thing for line staff to have to do. So they have to understand why it is the study's happening and really buy into it. Um, Program external partners are also very important um, because they're also, you know, in addition to being funders, they're also referral sources. Um, one study I worked on, um, a program got a large share of its um, participants from the local TANF agency. And um, the staff from the program sat down with all the leadership and the line staff and the TANF agency to be very clear, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. You're probably gonna hear some um, unhappiness from your participants, but this is, you know, we don't want this relationship to end. So just be clear on why that's happening. Um, if you are running a program that's well known in a community, which, we, you know, there was one in Chicago that had been embedded since, you know, the 90s, uh, it's also important to get community leadership on board through conversations to hear their concerns and help ease them. So stakeholders is very, very important. Um, another factor is if possible, provide financial assistance to potential sites um, at a minimum, uh, reimbursing them for the cost of implementing the study, which includes data collection, um, monitoring, random assignment, things like that. Um, that can go away towards easing concerns of site staff um, about participating in, a, participating in a study and if, you know, if possible, uh, funding available to help them scale their program or um, add new components to make it a stronger contrast with business as usual. Uh, we, I was very lucky with PACE that we had foundation funding to work with programs to help them, you know, increase the number of slots that they could provide or to add new components. Um, and then also uh, to help ease the burden, um, help with any sort of external IRB paperwork. I found that, you know, helping with the paperwork, being available to speak to the IRB uh, can be very helpful. Um, and then quickly, a few thoughts on program fidelity, because that's something we think about when we go into the field. But sometimes it's not a concept that we can really take into account because we are, sort of, you know, studying a grant program that is up and running. It's new. For example, the Department of Labor grants um, include a requirement about valuation sometimes. Um, so you're evaluating something as it's being implemented. And that can be really, really difficult. Um, so in those cases, it's important to just document clearly what the program is doing at the time that you're designing the evaluation procedures and then um, work closely to monitor through regular calls with staff. Um, and then the final point I wanted to make are some of the additional challenges when you have, you're trying to include multiple sites um, so that you have an adequate sample size. So instead of one college, operating, say, the IBEST program, you have multiple colleges, and trying to ensure that they are all operating something that is akin to what the intended design was. So in the case of IBEST, there are state standards. Um, in the case of some programs that have multiple arms or um, multiple cities operating the program, making sure that the key components are actually implemented. And so there's a lot of groundwork um, you know, boots on the ground, ideally, if we can go in person, but a lot of conversations take place before determining whether a site is ready for inclusion in a study. So with that, I will um, conclude and um, I guess pass the baton to Jarni.
Um, thank you so much, Karen. Before you do, um, I'm going to ask Samantha to um, host another poll, um, again, to get a little bit of um, the audience's experience uh, with uh, uh, looking at implementation fidelity. I'll give you all a, a few seconds to, to chime in. Great. Samantha, do you want to show the, the results? Gotcha. Great. Again, a, a, a range of, of experience. So um, hopefully a lot of, you know, the specifics that Karen um, provided are really helpful um, and, and how that plays out uh, during evaluations, that, that real life experience. Thanks again, Karen. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jarnay. Hi there, can you hear me? We can. Great. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to expound upon uh, a few of Karen's comments on points to consider, uh, which also echo um, some of the points that have been discussed or raised earlier uh, in, the, in the meeting as well. Um, one important point that I wanted to raise is the importance of understanding how the intervention fits within the context of an existing agency's or organization's structure. Um, this is a very critical point when thinking about um, site readiness and, and how to actually implement things. Um, this issue is something we came across when implementing two large demonstrations for the Social Security Administration. Uh, the mental health treatment study and the supported employment demonstration. In both the mental health treatment study and the supported employment demonstration, we selected community mental health agencies around the U.S. to serve as study sites for participants who were randomized to a treatment arm. So as the participants were enrolled into the study and randomized to a treatment arm, they essentially became new clients at the study sites. So the reason this is an important issue or consideration is because many of these community-based agencies operate on very tight shoestring budgets. Um, they already have an existing staffing structure uh, that they abide by to accommodate a fixed number of clients. Um, and they're already working at a certain equilibrium, so to speak, um, to ensure that they can appropriately deliver services to their client base in a timely manner. So when approaching programs or sites about participating in a research study or an evaluation and thinking about exactly how the intervention will be implemented in these real life settings, it's critical for evaluators to consider implementation strategies that will, minimi that will minimize disruptions to the existing balance they have. So what I mean by that is evaluators would want to consider things like what is a reasonable number of new clients to expect an agency to take on? Um, so for example, should treatment sites or, or programs reduce their client workloads in order to be able to accommodate um, new clients as a result of participation in the study? Or does it make more sense to have the site or the agency increase its capacity by hiring new staff so that they can accommodate those new clients? If in fact um, resources are provided by the study to help deal with some of these issues, another important point to consider is what happens to the new staff once the study is over. So these are um, some challenges that we faced when um, designing the uh, demonstration and evaluation for both the mental health treatment study and the supported employment demonstration. Um, we were able to build from some of the lessons that we learned in the mental health treatment study um, and use that to an adva our advantage when developing the plan for the supported employment demonstration. Um, as one example, uh, we saw in the mental health treatment study that once the study was over, some of the um, provider staff who had been hired specifically for the study had actually left the agency before the study was over because naturally they were concerned about 
um, job security and needed to move on to their, their next opportunity so they could continue to pay their bills. And so that was um, something that we uh, experienced on the MHGS and tried to take that into consideration when designing the strategy for the support and employment demonstration on how to um, either build capacity within sites to be able to uh, bring on new staff or, or gradually increase the number of new clients um, so that their existing workloads could be adjusted as needed to accommodate those individuals. Um, a second point that I wanted to, to raise concerns the importance of understanding what comprises the intervention. Um, so in other words, knowing the answer to the question, what's in the black box? It's important for evaluators to understand this so that the intervention so that the intervention is in fact not a black box. If the evaluation is successful and the intervention proves to be effective, can you clearly articulate exactly what the intervention entails so that it can be replicated? So in addition to talking about and discussing the importance of fidelity, I wanted to raise this point to mention the importance of process evaluations and implementation analysis to help evaluators gain insights into these issues. So for example, um, thinking about uh, specifically the mental health treatment study and the supported employment demonstration, for evaluations such as these, where sites are monitored to ensure delivery of high fidelity services, should the ongoing provision of training and technical assistance to sites and their provider staff be considered part of the intervention? For studies such as these, it's important that evaluators understand how sites typically operate, what training and TA was provided to enable them to provide the intervention to treatment participants, and then how did this vary across multiple sites? Delving into these kinds of issues will help an evaluator to better understand what is and what is not in the black box. And that uh, concludes my introductory comments, Lauren. Thank you, Charnae. I uh, really appreciate it. I'm seeing some common threads um, uh, across your comments around helping uh, sites with some funding because they can be under-resourced and um, it may be challenging to, uh, for them to participate without additional funding, but also um, uh, the role of implementation studies as well as um, the challenges around uh, staff turnout. So definitely hearing these. I know Mike's going to um, also touch on some of these these risks, these threats um, to site readiness and implementation fidelity. But before we turn to Mike, I'm going to do another poll question. Samantha, if you would put that up. Um, and so just, you know, we have uh, just four challenges here around ensuring site readiness and monitoring uh, implementation fidelity, just kind of for you, what have been some of the big challenges or, or issues? And, you know, we just put up four here. Um, if you want to, in um, either the chat, the chat function, um, I saw this in an earlier sec session, um, if you have other challenges that you really think are important, please feel free to, to post those. And I'll give everybody a few seconds here to look that through. Great, thanks for posting that. Uh, the, the highest, um, the highest uh, percentage uh, uh, was for challenges recruiting study participants. And I think we're, gonna, we're definitely gonna dig into um, recruitment. We heard some earlier discussions um, about that as well. Um, but then close second, catching and addressing issues with implementation. Yeah, and we're gonna cover that some more too. Uh, staff resistance then as a third. Um, and organizational resistance um, during site selection. So great, thank you guys so much. Um, and so with, with that, Mike, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me to participate and I really enjoyed uh, Karen and Jarnie's comments and I've enjoyed working with, with Karen, uh, particularly over many, many years. Um, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, because I think, you know, we really, it's just critical to whether or not we learn the things we want to learn from our field experiments and our evaluation work. And we want a fair test of the intervention that we are examining. 
And it's not help while we can learn from badly implemented experiments, and we do all the time. Um, you know, we really want to know whether or not the interventions that we're testing uh, really are effective and for whom. And to do that, it has to be implemented as intended on the ground. And so this is something you just cannot pay enough attention to from my perspective. I think it, it starts at the very beginning of being aware uh, in the design stage to the key threats to sample buildup, participation and implementation during design, and doing everything you can at that point to mitigate risk before you actually begin implementation. You know, some of the things that we focus on is getting as much data as we can on the potential target population uh, so that we can get the sample we hope to achieve. Uh, this isn't always easy. Uh, and uh, you can oftentimes spend a fair amount of time digging into administrative data or digging into past experience that sites have to try to be sure that we can get the sample we hope to get, that the pool of people is there to draw from to build a desired sample. Also, just focusing a lot on participation. Uh, if you're looking at a program that's already operating, trying to understand what their actual participation experiences are. They don't often know this. They know how many people they serve. Uh, but they don't oftentimes pay attention to how many people that say they're getting referrals from different sources, what proportion of the referrals actually uh, take up services, what proportion of the people that they enroll actually take up services. Uh, this isn't often a metric that programs focus on, but it's really, really critical to us as we try to field good experiments. And so we try to pay a lot of attention to that in advance. Um, and then really trying to understand program operations on the ground going in. Uh, sometimes you have very few degrees of freedom as to what to do with how programs are operating. They're grant funded and they operate as they operate. And other times you have quite a bit of freedom to try to work with folks to, to try to shore up and strengthen processes and, and, and augment program delivery to get a strong intervention uh, for testing. So this will vary from experience to experience, but looking at it up front is, is really important as, as well as along the way. Also be aware that there are pressures on, on sometimes on key design parameters, particularly when funders are involved and they have expectations around participation numbers and outcomes. And sometimes those goals that programs have to meet to satisfy participants are not aligned with your goals of your evaluation. Uh, you know, they may, if they're having trouble getting the number of people in they want, they may want to stretch and change uh, the, the, the requirements for participation to expand the target population to meet numbers. And that may not work for what you're trying to do because you're testing an intervention you think is targeted at folks, let's say, with significant barriers, and they're leaving that, uh, that, that frame in order to meet target numbers. Or sometimes the focus on outcome measures can push them again to try to focus on folks that are easier to serve and harder to serve. So again, just be aware of that. You can't always do much about it, but at least you can try to be aware and educate people on the ground about it. And that leads me to how important it is that site leadership and staff and key uh, stakeholders, as have been said already, really understand the test and really taking the time to educate people on the ground as to why this is important, to understand the aspects of, of, of the sample and the target population and why that matters to the test, to help them appreciate the impact of participation on program impacts. Uh, they can run a great program, but if 20% of their participants actually participate in the program, we're not, we're not likely to find impacts. So they need to understand that pushing hard uh, to get everybody involved in the program is really, really important. Um, so, and really, and also the impact of fidelity. On, on, on implementation and on impacts. So just you know, helping them all the way along the way to understand that and to uh, answer their questions and be transparent and be open and kind of create an educated partner. Um, and it's interesting, if you look at some of the evaluation work, it's, we seem to see a pattern that certain sites come back over and over again. We work with a lot of the same partners in doing evaluations. And I, I think that's because they really do become committed to doing this work and understand the value and they understand what's involved in doing it. Um, monitor sample buildup, participant characteristics, participation rates, program implementation closely, uh, all along the way, but particularly early on. We oftentimes do a pilot stage or a early assessment stage where we start a random assignment, but we use the first 30, 60, 90 days to really take a hard look at sample buildup, participation, 
look at how the program is being implemented, go in uh, on the ground, uh, talk to everybody involved, talk to participants, and problem solve. You know, we're, we're, we really want to have a strong test. And so that early focus can help us make adjustments to create a stronger path going forward. And then you just need to continually stay in touch all the way along the line and, and, um, and just frequent contact. You cannot have uh, too much contact with folks. And also paying attention to external events uh, that can affect any of these factors. Uh, and really, you know, sometimes there are, sometimes you're aware of external events, oftentimes you're not, and kind of tuning in the folks that you're talking to on the ground so that they can tell you, oh, there's been a funding cut here or a new program implemented here, or, you know, there's been some turnover that's taken place that's going to affect the impact of the program and our ability to implement it well. Uh, to the extent you're aware of these things, you've got the opportunity to try to do something about it. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that. Uh, I could go on for much too long because this is a subject that I, I think is really, really, really important. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, this is great. And again, thanks for rounding out the comments today and, and talking through some of those, those threats um, and solutions to them, which is what we all really are, are interested in. Um, we're going to get to some, some question and, uh, questions uh, from the audience, um, but I did want to um, just put up one last, last poll, just kind of based on these comments. What um, are the um, topics that, that you all are really interested in hearing from, from our, our commenters um, and, and getting their, their, uh, their reflections on? Um, so Samantha has put up the, this last question and I'll give you a few seconds to respond. Okay, so the really thinking about the strategies, processes, and tools for preparing sites for an impact evaluation. Great. Um, well, I think um, let's let's start there. I'm gonna I'm gonna pose um, just a question or two um, to the the panelists uh, or to our, our commenters here, and um, just to give folks also a chance to um, uh, pose pose questions. Please, um, the audience, uh, use the question and answer function, um, that box there, and I, I see a few coming up. Uh, uh, panelists, I know um, you can't use the, the Q&A box, so please, um, I will monitor the, the chat box as well. Um, great. So I, I think let's let's really start there. So what, you know, we you all talked about some, some of the strategies for um, getting sites ready for random assignment and for an impact study. Um, but it, it, maybe you could just talk through just some of the key steps you take um, to, to, to do that. What, do you, what are you thinking about uh, first and then kind of, uh, you know, steps along the way. Um, is there somebody that wants to take that one first? I can take it. Thanks, Karen. So once, when I start working with a site, I'll usually start with a logic model that outlines exactly what the components of the program are, who the target population is, what are the outputs, so how many individuals are expected to be served in any given time frame, what are the expected short-term impacts and the longer-term impacts, and then kind of undergirding it all is the um, context of the community, including what sort of services are available to the control group. And I find it's helpful to go through that carefully with the program. Um, usually we identify one or two liaisons at a program to work with us on the design of the evaluation and make sure that we're all in agreement that this is, um, you know, these are the elements, this is the program, these are were expect expected outcomes. Uh, then I do a, um, a mapping of where uh, random assignment will occur. So all these programs need to have somewhere where people apply and where you can administer a baseline survey and conduct random assignment. Um, so I again work closely with staff on that to make sure that we're all in agreement where random assignment will happen. And then what programs find very helpful is um, all of the, like working on all of the materials that are associated with launching random assignments. So we put together very detailed manuals that go through, here are the steps to random assignment, here are scripts that you can use to explain during orientation what the study is, here are scripts that you can use to talk to people as, you know, before 
you know, they have the opportunity to consent to explain what the study is, um, how to talk to people after they find out they were assigned to the control group, um, just a, a manual with um, all sorts of resources that they can use um, you know, throughout the study. And then also um, conducting random assignment training of the staff um, right before the launch of random assignments so we can stay on site and um, observe it. So um, those are some of the um, tools that we've used in the past that have been very helpful. Um, so see if others have a would like to add. Yeah, Mike and Jarnay, did, did you all want to add anything to Karen's description? So just to uh, yeah. keep back off of um, Karen's response just a little bit further, uh, one thing that we found very helpful to, to just kind of clearly lay all of those kinds of things out for sites as you're going through those discussions with them is to think about the agreement or, or even contract that you're gonna set up with the site. Um, at a minimum, hopefully a, a memorandum of understanding can be established, um, but for studies that involve um, you know, compensation of some sort to the sites for the conduct of the research or for the provision of the um, intervention services, obviously you'll need um, a contract to kind of lay out all these details, lay out all of those details. And so we found um, that vehicle to be especially helpful in guiding those conversations and, and helping to um, you know, answer questions, uh, provide the sites with information that they may have not have thought about of on their own to um, you know, maybe mitigate some questions, issues, or challenges that could have occurred down the road. Um, and I think it also just helps to add um, a layer of accountability there because all those things are, are laid out and, and there is an actual agreement between both parties that, you know, these are the protocols that we're going to adhere to. These are the services that we're going to provide. These are the additional expectations because of the research aspect of this um, and so we found that to be especially helpful for both the um, mental health treatment study and the supported employment demonstration. Mike, go, go ahead. I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with everything you've said. Uh, I think that the one, a couple of things I would add is I really try to focus on looking at readiness again on, on target population questions. I mean, can we get the sample, the right sample we want from the site in terms of what the flow of participants is likely to be? Uh, really try to spend time understanding the, the intervention again that they're delivering and whether or not that intervention is, is, uh, is what we hope to evaluate, whether we can learn something from it. Uh, the data capacity that the site has to provide good data to us, I think is really important. We haven't mentioned that, but we rely very heavily on, on data the site collects, particularly for our implementation research. And so understanding that is, is I think, is an important issue. And then finally, um, you know, leader support and organizational stability. I mean, I think we just, those are factors we try to assess in our interaction with sites through the site readiness process. And understanding that readiness isn't static, it's somewhat dynamic. Uh, sites sometimes seem quite ready and unfortunately things change and they're not ready. And uh, so just realizing that no matter how, how well you try to nail these things down at the beginning, uh, you've got to be prepared for changes along the way. Great, Mike. Thank you. Um, uh, and so um, I'm going to turn to the audience, and we definitely have a, a great set of, of questions so far. I really encourage you all to, to keep asking questions. And um, we've got about we've got about a little less than a half hour here, so definitely want to um, hear from all of you. And maybe some of these um, uh, questions and answers will spark some ideas as well. And I, I also encourage you, if you do have an example and you don't mind typing it up, and I can I'd be happy to share it with um, with the audience that, that you know that could be relevant to our discussion here. Great to hear ideas and and comments like that as well. Um, so, so I'm going to start off um, with a question from Rob Olson, and he asked um, for Mike and for others, uh, does strong implementation always ensure a fair test? If moderate implementation is more typical, even more realistic, then strong implementation, um, then strong implementation, is it possible that rigorous impact studies of strongly implemented programs will lead us to overestimate the likely effects of scaling these programs? If so, how can we decide if the level of implementation is optimal, not too weak, not too strong, and that it's replicable? 
That's a good question. I think it depends what kind of evaluation you're doing. I mean, if you're doing an efficacy test where you've got an intervention that you really want to know, can this intervention be effective or not? Uh, and I guess there's some level. I mean, you know, you can, you know, I guess there's is strong a Cadillac, a Ford, or a, I'm not sure what, what, what the current right words are for different cars these days. But I mean, is it, you know, what is kind of, you don't want to test something that is so souped up uh, that it's never going to be replicable, probably. But I think if it's an efficacy test, you want to have a strong test of, of what you're trying to, to demonstrate. I think if you're trying to evaluate a program in situation, you know, the HPOD uh, grants as an example, uh, or WIOA, uh, there's a large-scale test there. But I think uh, it's more of an effectiveness evaluation, and you just want to know uh, a test of how, how it's actually operating on the ground in real terms without a lot of support and assistance. So I think it depends what your the research questions are. Anyone else want to add to that? Jarnair, Karen? No? That's okay. Great. And uh, Laura, Laura just um, post, Laura Peck just posted, um, just, you know, comment. Um, it's why I prefer the concept of smart rather than best practices, which I think is, is a really helpful way to think about it, you know, which are in the tail of the distribution and unlikely to be replicable. So that's a great, great point, Laura. Thank you. Um, great. Um, on to next question from Sandy Schiffers. Um, we need very much to know what is provided to the control comparison group members and whether there is really sufficient contrast to the treatment group. Similarly, we need to understand how many treatment group members actually receive the core intervention. Um, for example, many treatment group members for training do not actually receive any training. Great point. Um, the question is on whether statistical adjustments are sufficient to address this and what methods may mitigate this in, in rigorous evaluations. I'm not going to go there. I'm not a statistician. Yeah. So okay. my goal is to try to make sure you've got a strong control and, yeah. and a well-implemented yep. uh, intervention. I agree. I, I'm, I'm not a statistician, um, but I do, as part of determining the uh, whether a site is a good candidate for the study, if you do, I mean, sometimes, as Mike mentioned, HPOG is an example where you're in a study, whether you want to or not. Um, so at that point, you just have to really understand what the control group can access and then collect, you know, as much data as you can through surveys to measure if people engaged in services at all. And if so, how often and what was the dosage? Um, and you can also use administrative records from the program to determine how many people attended and for how long. Of course, that's not available to the control group in a lot of circumstances, but um, but yeah, we, we try and do as much as we can on the front end to prepare for that eventuality before we turn things over to the economists and statisticians. Great. And, uh, this is Jarn, I, I echo uh, both Karen and, and Mike's response that I'm not a statistician. <laughs> um, but uh, at least again, in the context of the supported employment demonstration and the mental health treatment study, just to provide a specific answer to the question about um, what was the control group provided. Um, the, the treatment group participants were provided with a very, very comprehensive package of, of services. Um, the control group uh, was defined by the study as um, services as usual. And so what we did is um, when participants were recruited and enrolled to the study, if they were randomized to uh, the control arm, we provided them with a what we called community resource manual, where we provided them with a list of national as well as local resources, um, local agencies within their individual communities that um, do provide services similar to those provided to the treatment group. Um, we didn't point them to any agency in particular. We didn't you know, bring their attention to any specialized set of services. We simply made sure that they did have that list of resources and then they were free to seek those services out on their own as they saw fit. Um, so that's how we uh, treated our, our services as usual or control participants for both of those studies. Um, but I also just wanted to, to mention um, 
in, in regards to the second piece of that question, as well as some of what um, Rob Olson raised in, in his question, it made me think back to the, the points there about um, the importance of defining what's in the black box. Um, because in both the MHGS and the supported employment demonstration, that's certainly a challenge that we are encountering because of this, this integrated package of services that we're providing to um, treatment participants. Um, obviously, different people will have different needs, and so everybody may not need the you know, full array of services. Some people may want clinical services, but may not want employment services or vice versa. They may want the employment services, but may not have a need for or, or want the, the clinical services. And so defining um, not only what's in the black box, but, but thinking about issues related to how do you measure dosage or, or engagement? Um, what are reasonable ways to measure and quantify the degree to which someone received the quote unquote intervention um, when it's so multifaceted and there are so many different um, components to it? So I think those are um, a lot of, of issues that um, putting more effort and, and resources into um, understanding what's in that black box through the conduct of um, the process evaluations and, and implementation analyses can help um, shed light on, on some of those issues as you're trying to figure out those impacts. Thanks, Jorne. Very helpful. Um, I'm going to turn to a question from Annalisa Mastry, one of our earlier panelists. Um, and this question is, is for Jarne. Um, I'm sure the other panelists could, could comment on it too, but um, could you expand on your point about factoring in the monitoring and technical assistance provided as a part of the evaluation in the description of the program implementation, cost, replicability, et cetera? How do you distinguish what is evaluation TA from what is program TA, it seems like a blurry line potentially. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> which is um, why I raised it as an important point for consideration. Um, so on both these studies, um, there's a big, huge um, implementation component, actual implementation of the evaluation, and then there's a, an independent evaluation of, of, of the intervention. Um, both studies, uh, we're providing services to participants over an extended period of time. The MHTS provided services to treatment participants for a period of two years following study enrollment. For the supported employment demonstration, um, study participation is a three-year period. Um, so the contract actually requires that, that we um, measure uh, fidelity to the model. Um, there are uh, established and validated scales to measure the delivery of um, support and employment according to the individual placement and support the IPS model. And so that's one thing that we're definitely um, closely assessing on the evaluation side. But um, separate from that, the implementation team whose responsibility is to shore up all of the treatment sites and ensure that they are providing um, services the way they should be. They are responsible for monitoring that on their own and, and then providing technical assistance to the sites as needed um, for areas where they may be falling short or um, need additional um, guidance. And so they're definitely is a, a blurry line there um, because of this research requirement in, uh, in terms of at what point is that just an artifact of, of the contract? We were required to you know, provide this, this continual improvement and, and feedback to them. Um, and, and, and when does it get to the point where this is now a part of the treatment? So for example, um, we obviously had some initial training for site staff um, prior to the start of the study and bringing participants on. And then um, as we got into the demonstration period, um, each site has a, a signed techni technical assistance and quality assurance monitor um, that does provide um, you know, guidance and points them to resources and puts them in contact with um, clinical experts as needed to, to deal with specific client issues. Um, they even help arrange for consultations with clinical experts for participants that have especially complicated or um, chaotic situations. And we are starting to feel like that piece of it, because it is 
relatively intensive. We're providing a lot of that from the um, implementation experts. We're starting to feel like that that's actually a piece of the intervention that has to be talked about um, and described in some kind of way, especially when you think about the fact that if in fact this does prove to be um, effective and show impacts, we need to be able to clearly articulate, well, what is it that sites need to be able to replicate that model and, and do it on a broader scale? That's really interesting, Jernay. Um, I see Mike, Mike nodding his head. <laughs> I didn't know if you want to say anything or Karen? No? No, just that I, I agree and, and I think it's really important <laughs> in reports to, to document what support sites received as part of, of, the, of the process so that it's clear and transparent. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, as, as Karen started out her presentation, I'll, I'll say documentation, documentation, documentation. <laughs> 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 she echoed the stakeholder comment like that. Um, yes, I certainly agree with that, Mike. It's so critical to, to document all of that so that you mm -hmm. can at least, you know, look back and, and be able to clearly describe um, what you did. And also by documenting those things, again, that's, that's information that can be um, delved into deeper by means of, of process analyses or implementation analyses to see how the provision of those specific things um, did change service delivery or how it differs from the way these sites usually operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wanna echo something um, Drenay said earlier about the importance of um, some sort of agreement with the site in writing an MOU or a site agreement, which lays out very, clearly we as evaluation team are going to do x y and z and you as the site or you know we'll do this that and the other thing um, mostly we focus on the evaluation technical assistance um, oftentimes um, programs that we're studying have if they're part of a grant program have a ta provider whose responsibility is on the programmatic side um, and so keeping in touch with that individual your the counterpart on the ta side is also important to doc you know to have conversations and to document what they're doing um but yeah so again document 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 important <laughs> <laughs> thanks karen um I, again i encourage you all to share comments questions ideas um in in the q a um uh, box uh, for attendees and the chat function for panelists. Um, I have a question from, from Steve Bell, and I think it dovetails pretty nicely from, from all these conversations that we're having um, about um, uh, implementation fidelity. Um, so, you know, he, his uh, comment is, the shared declaration of all the panelists regarding the importance of getting site readiness and intervention fidelity right implies that sometimes the evaluation team should pull out with the site giving it up, uh, giving up on it, participating in the experiment rather than uh, taking it through a, a too long, too difficult and likely unsuccessful process of remediation. Um, you know, the, the results uh, in studying a not so great site. Um, do we pull, his question is, do we pull the plug often enough or is that too difficult to do given sunk costs and sample size pressures? Oh, I think that's a really good question, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have pulled the plug on sites before. Um, I, in a perfect <laughs> world, we, you know, we'll have done enough research and groundwork to understand what issues may come up when we actually start the evaluation. Um, sometimes when you do a pilot, it's just, you know, clear that the site cannot be in the study and we will pull the plug on it even though there are some costs. Um, where that becomes more difficult is when you've got a grant program where all sites are in regardless of whether they're ready to um, participate or not and then you have to figure out sort of how to mitigate those issues. I think, I think that's a really tough question to be honest with you. There's so much inertia, frankly, and some cost involved when you get going with sites. Uh, there's there's interest on, on everybody's part in many respects, unless there's unless the site is literally rebelling from participation. But if you're having challenges with getting sample, uh, or you're not satisfied with the strength of the intervention, uh, you know it, it's it, there's a tendency to want to make it better to fix it. 
And the further you go down that road of fixing it, the more your sunk costs increase. So it's really tough. I think the best, the thing that we try to do, and I don't know that we do it as successful as we could, is to establish benchmarks up front with the site in terms of expectations, expectations around sample buildup, expectations around participation, expectations around implementation. And literally put those in the site agreements that we develop with sites um, and, and monitor against them early and, and, and have hard conversations. And, 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 and ultimately, it's a judgment call uh, as to whether you try to keep making it better if things aren't going well or you pull the plug. And pulling the plug is tough. Anyone else want to comment on that issue? Um, I, I agree with uh, both uh, Karen and Mike. Um, we, we have had that experience in, in uh, one of the studies, particularly on the mental health treatment study, where we did, in fact, have to um, shut down two, two sites. Um, and in one case, if I remember correctly, um, we were fortunate in the sense that that was something that was recognized relatively earlier on in the um, demonstration period before, I guess, too many costs got sunk into, into the site um, before the decision was made. Um, but thinking back to some of um, Karen's comments earlier, I think, as well as Mike's, I think um, thinking about the site leadership and, and, and the buy-in at the leadership level um, plays a huge factor in, in that decision. Um, because as I think it was Mike had mentioned earlier, um, you know, you never know what can happen. And even when you bring on board a site that you feel is ready, things can happen later on down the road. Um, you could end up with, you know, total staff turnover. You could end up with um, turnover at the leadership level. Any, anything can happen to um, drastically impact the, the site's ability to provide high quality services. Um, but I do think in those sites uh, where there is definite, um, you know, buy-in from the leadership and, and they're willing to, um, invest the, the resources and, and, you know, they're vested in the importance of, of what you're doing. I think that makes a huge difference in the ability to potentially turn the situation around. And, and that's something that should be considered when you're faced with the decision of do we, do we cut bait or do we try to, you know, keep pushing forward. Yeah, just to add to that. So we had one site in um, a job search assistance study that despite the, all the technical assistance we could provide around recruiting um, to bring more people in. It was a time, you know, when the economy was strong and people weren't returning to training programs. They were just going out into the, um, into the workforce and we just couldn't generate enough sample size. And so we, for that site, turned it into an implementation study as opposed to a um, impact study. So we did, use the information we had gathered it just we used it in a different way that's that's a really you know gosh you know the, the sunk cost issue i think you know you can help address there and, and learn something from the site um you know and it that that's an external factor i think you know you, you all have been talking about external factors as well that can affect um you know for intervention fidelity um for sure and um that that makes that makes a lot of sense um, I do want to follow up with you, maybe just, uh, I, I don't see any more questions right now. Folks, please feel free to add them to the Q&A box. But um, I just wanted to dig a little bit deeper um, into, into monitoring um, and uh, intervention fidelity and just kind of some of the, the ways in which you are, are monitoring, like what, what are the tools that you have and how, you know, how, you know, if, if there are issues with fidelity to the model, how are you identifying them? Participant data, surveys. I know we've talked a lot about implementation studies, but you know the, the little the the brass tacks around that. <laughs> well, so well. I'll start with something that Mike's talked a little bit about, which is, you know, monitoring the um, kind of fidelity to the evaluation design, which um, is very important, at least in the initial months of the study, when um, you're trying to determine how many people are coming in, basically the funnel of um, participants, how many people are coming to orientations of those, how many are 
um, consenting to be in the study, how many of those are being randomly signed to each group, and how many of those are starting the intervention. So we've worked with sites in the past to, with a worksheet, a simple Excel worksheet that we ask them to kind of fill out each time there's an orientation. So for example, one site it was every other week and they would document all of those metrics. And if, it, if over time it looked like a lot of people were dropping off between the orientation and consenting, trying to figure out why that is and what you can do about it. Is it scripting? Is it messaging? Is it you know being clear that it's not a no service control group? Um, and then again, looking at the other end as to how many people are actually attending, and if they aren't, what's going on is, you know, does random assignment happen too far in advance of the start of a program? For example, if it starts in the fall semester and you're doing random assignment in the spring semester, um, maybe you want to kind of change the random assignment date so um, or time, time period. So that's a little bit about evaluation, <laughs> evaluation of fidelity. I don't know, um, Mike, were you going to say something? I think I cut you off. No, we were both uh, chuckling a bit about that one. It's a hard, you know, it's a good question. I mean, I think the easiest things to monitor are recruitment, sample buildup, and participation. I mean, there's data there. You can track it. You can work with programs to get better data and more granular data to help. Uh, and so those are kind of, the, I mean, we do that and it's relatively easy to do it. To fix it is another story, but to monitor <laughs> it is really doable. I think the implementation fidelity is harder because unlike IPS, which has really well-established fidelity criteria, you know, most of the programs we work with don't have well-established fidelity criteria. I think that's a, I think that's a problem in our mm -hmm. field, you know, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have more uh, employment and training programs that, that really make clear what their fidelity requirements are and we can test them and we'll learn more from doing that. I think one of the challenges mm -hmm. is some of the programs we evaluate are somewhat amorphous as to what fidelity means and you know, what is mm -hmm. good job development, what is good job matching, what is, you know, what, mm -hmm. what's a good job search program, you know. And, right. and so I think it's, so when we're monitoring fidelity to that, it's kind of challenging because, you know, we, try to build some criteria and we look at it, we talk to people, we look at data, uh, but it's, it's much fuzzier and much grayer than I think I, I, than I would prefer, frankly. Yeah. I mean, on the data question, I think if there's the option of building an MIS specific to the study where you can have um, ask staff, again, asking them and having them actually do it consistently are two different issues, but ask them to input you know, dosage, you know, did people show up for their first counseling session or their second counseling session? Or did they, you know, how many weeks of class did they attend? Um, sometimes you can get that through administrative records from the site. Sometimes you can't. Um, sometimes it's apples and oranges if you don't put some um, data points out there that you really want to focus on. Um, the other point I would make is that, um, we have calls regularly with sites, usually twice a month when random assignments starting up and then monthly thereafter. And during those calls, in addition to checking in on, you know, sample buildup and any recruitment challenges, you know, we ask questions about staffing, if any staff left, what, you know, who's going to take over, how's that going to affect the program or the service delivery. And we try and monitor um, what's going on with the program. But as Mike mentioned, you know, without any actual benchmarks or you know, signposts for fidelity. It's a little hard to kind of document it other than, you know, writing down comments and keeping track, you know, over time. Yeah. I mean, one method that I really like to understand what's going on in programs is to actually sit down with workers and have them talk through specific people and cases they're working with and you kind of use their case files and and, and really, and try to use real, because when you talk to people about programs in general and you're trying to understand what's going on, they give you examples and anecdotes that generally illustrate the best case of what's ever happening. And so it's just really helpful if you can walk through a half a dozen, 10 cases that are, you know, that are picked relatively at random and just have them walk through, well, what happened to person X? What happened to person Y? What services did they receive? What happened? What, why did they drop out? You know, and, and in doing that, it kind of gives you a better window and you kind of get better insights into what's going on inside the program, I think. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, I 
we're just about ready to close out here, but I, I do want to pose just one more um, just follow up, um, especially to, to Mike's um, comment about, you know, the employment and training field and that, um, you know, evaluations for, for this field, we don't do a great job of having a model um, with which we can document fidelity in a really rigorous way. Um, and you know that that's that's just a real challenge for us right now. Um, and and so I think just my follow up you know question is um, kind of where do you think you know in the field of employment and training evaluation um, do we need more guidance, more best practices for evaluators seeking to do this work? For evaluators, okay. That's a, I mean, I, actually, I, I again, I may not be the most well read on evaluation practices. I'm busy doing it more than reading about it, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I have, I'm not aware that there's been a real concerted effort to, to kind of write up what we've been talking about on this yep. panel today and in a way that could be helpful to folks that are getting into this work, you know, and, and there's a huge wealth of knowledge now. I mean, I've been involved in this work one way or another for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. I lost track of time. And, 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 you know, over time, more people are doing it. We've done a lot more of this evaluation work. There's a, a whole host of firms with enormous levels of experience. And, and we share that with each other because we often team together when we do work, so we learn from each other. But to kind of put it out in a way that can be helpful more broadly, um, I think would be really valuable to do. Yeah, and we had some folks, you know, on this, uh, uh, in this session, you know, that talked about earlier, not really having a lot of experience. So having mm -hmm. um, some way to, to provide some really um, good guidance and practices seems, seems needed. Yeah. How about you guys all author something? <laughs> so it's, um, it's important. This is the whole range, right? Like yeah. guidance from site recruitment all the way through how you, implement the study and monitor fidelity and it's I mean that would be quite a volume I think it would be very interesting um, one of the things we did for PACE which only touches on a little bit of that is we talked to all the programs like the leadership of the programs and asked them why they participated and you know a couple of them were grantees that had to so um, they were volunteered but um, we talked to them as well about what sort of guidance would you you know, give evaluation teams in terms of how to, um, you know, go about site recruitment. And it was really very interesting qualitative sub-study. And we wrote it up and it's on the um, OPRE PACE website, but also career-pathways.org. Um, and they had some good, you know, good reflections on why they were in the study and how you can use that going forward to help recruit sites. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'm going to I'm going to leave you with um, the last word from the panelists. Um, and Laura, Laura, Laura Peck just uh, said um, that, that you all should definitely write this up and, and think about submitting it to the American Journal of Evaluation. So you can talk to her more about that. Um, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate all the expertise that you brought to the discussion. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Patty um, to uh, introduce the next session. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you.